we've been talking a lot about hearing from God. Uh, for a number of weeks now, we've been uh, exploring what God's Word has to say and some of the things that we could do in order to help us to be able to hear from Him. And I find that in, in my life situation, there are some times where I'm really trying to hear from God, and there are other times where like, maybe I'm not really trying, but I do hear from Him. And then other times, I'm just sort of doing my own thing, and, and maybe I'm not being a very good listener. But if I'm, if I'm really seeking God, if I really want to be a careful listener, it's usually because I'm in the midst of making a big decision. Am I alone here? Is that how it goes? Like when you are making a decision about whether it's going to be vanilla or chocolate ice cream, no, God doesn't necessarily have to weigh in on that, okay? But if it's something that has to do with, uh, with life, something that has to do with my marriage or uh, parenting or my job, uh, where am I going to live, then these really big types of decisions, that kind of triggers in me that, oh yeah, you know what? I should probably be uh, carefully listening to what God has to say about this particular decision right here, uh, these, these big decisions where I want to find out God's will. And when we say God's will, we're talking about what God wants for your life and for mine, what he wants for us to do. Um, the direction, the plans that he has laid out for us, his desire for us, that's his will. And I need to find out what that is when I'm in the midst of a really big decision because the consequences are far-reaching. These types of decisions aren't just going to affect what will happen for the next 10 minutes. They're going to affect what will happen for the next 10 years or more. And some of you are in the midst of making that kind of a decision right now. Some of you have even mentioned to me about these decisions that you're facing. And if you're not, then I know that some are going to be facing that type of a decision soon, either because you've mentioned it or because that's life. That's how life goes, right? There come moments where we need to make decisions. Sometimes we know they're coming. Other times it really hits us, kind of blindsides us unexpectedly. And we find ourselves in that spot. All of us find ourselves in that place where we have to make a big, important decision. And in a moment like that, I hope you will try to find out, God, what is it that you want for me to do with this big decision? I know his way is always best. You know, he loves us. He wants good things for us. He's got a good plan for you and for me. And if I try it my way, it will only be good if it lines up with his way. So I really want to find out what is his way, what is his will. How is it that we can do that? How can we find out God's will for our lives? I want you to take a moment now and think about the decisions that you're facing, either decisions that are immediately upon you or in the near future. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, some of you have mentioned that you're thinking about retirement. You're thinking uh, when you might retire, how you might retire, whether you could now, if that's a good idea. If you've retired, then like maybe you need to kind of take a step back and get another part-time job, but you're thinking a little bit about retirement. Others are considering this moral dilemma. They're trying to figure out what is the right thing to do in this situation. And, and you're, you need to decide based upon various options, and it kind of looks like there's no real perfect option. The answer isn't obvious, and, and so we need to hear what God's will is for that moral dilemma. For others that I've spoken with, it has to do with the relationship. And for some of us, that's like, uh, who might I be in a relationship with? Who might I date? Who might I marry? For others, it's, what am I going to do with a relationship that's broken? How am I going to deal with uh, when I'm in a relationship with somebody and I've been hurt? And, and what is it that God wants me to do with that particular hurt? It could have to do with jobs. I've spoken with more than one of you about how um, you are seeking to hear from God. You're seeking God's will when it comes to a job, and you, you want to know how, where, to, where to find that job, or if they've offered it to you, whether to accept that job, and you're weighing your pros and your cons, and you're looking at the various options and trying to decide, is now the right time? Is now the right time for me to apply? Is now the right time for me to quit where I am? Is now the right time for me to accept the job if they offer it to me? Uh, kids, I, I've heard uh, occasionally uh, that, I mean, you know, if you're a parent, and, and most of the people in the room and watching the video now, most of us uh, have kids, not everybody, but uh, there come times where you need to make big and tough decisions about what you're going to do with your kids. How are you going to advise them? Where are you going to guide your kids? How are you going to uh, set boundaries for your kids and let them know, like, this is not okay. You don't want to head over there. You want to be on this side of the boundary. Or um, uh, which college to go to? That's been a decision that has been on the hearts of uh, some people here, or where to, whether to go to college at all. Uh, thinking about if you might go to one school or another, whether you would live at home, whether you would live on campus. Uh, some of you, I know, have been thinking about, and, and we should be trying to listen for God's will on whether or not to finally have that tough conversation. You, you've been thinking about it for some time now. 
And there's that person that you feel prompted, like, I, I really think I need to have that difficult conversation with this person, but I have reservations about talking about it. And you're wrestling with it, and you're trying to figure out if you should do it, and what you should say, and whether you should do it now, or if you should put it off, or whether you should say, hey, honey, you have the conversation. I'm just going to be close by, but you do it. And, and this is weighing on our hearts as these types of decisions that we have. Some of us have been thinking about moving, I've heard, uh, thinking about living in a different place, whether that's a, a different home or a different town. These are big decisions, decisions that sometimes we end up uh, second guessing or, or kind of just wishing that God would um, make the decision for us, right? If you would just figure this out for me, God, because I'm feeling all this pressure. And, and if you've recently made a decision, I know this is true for some of us, we've already made the decision and already started taking steps on what we're going to do in order to act upon that decision, but now that we've made it, and now that we're taking those steps, we're thinking, I, man, I don't know. I, I mean, was that right? Should I undo it? Should I undo the decision that I made and that I started to act upon? Is this the direction that I should still be going? And for others, the decision that we're making has to do with health, uh, choosing a treatment plan. When doctors or physicians come and they say, um, here are your options, or they say, we don't really have any options, and you've got to figure out what to do, either for yourself or for your loved one, and you're making these types of decisions, or something else, right? So whatever area it is in your life, we need to hear from God about these types of decisions. We need to figure out, what is his will for me? What is it that he wants for me to do? Which way should I go? Which option should I choose? And I want to share with you an example from my life about a time in the past where I went through that process. I had one of those big kinds of decisions that I needed to make, and boy, I felt a lot of pressure trying to figure out what should I do? Should I go this way or should I go that way? And I wanna talk with you a little bit about that, but I have to rewind before we get to that decision-making moment in my life, and I'm gonna tell you my life story. So when my mom and dad first fell in love, I'm kidding, that's not where it starts. Okay. I have, since the time I was a kid, I have wanted to earn a PhD. I love to learn new things, uh, I, I enjoy, um, the uh, academia and reading and writing. And so this was something that I had aspired to from a very young age. And I've been a pastor now for a, a number of years. This is my 22nd year in ministry. Uh, and when I found a school that was offering the, the type of study that I was trying to teach myself, they had put together courses and assembled a faculty that were gonna teach me the very thing that I wanted to learn. And I also got a scholarship. I was like, this is it, this is the time. And I got the, the thumbs up from my wife, Adrian. So then I knew it was right, okay? And she's like, yeah, go for it. You know, this has been your lifelong dream, Steve. Go for this PhD. But it didn't take me very long to realize full-time pastoral ministry and full-time PhD student work don't really go together very well. That was just too much on my plate. And I found myself stressed out and losing sleep and not able to cover all of my responsibilities. And I, I did not want the church that I was serving at the time to suffer. And so I had a decision to make and realized really the best thing for me to do at that point was I finished that ministry assignment back then and poured myself uh, into working full time at the school. But that also meant I didn't have income. So what might I do? And I ended up taking a part time job teaching for uh, the local Christian school. I was teaching Bible classes for middle school and high school students. They both smell the same. And I really liked that job a lot. It gave me an opportunity to still uh, minister to people. It wasn't the same as being a pastor, but uh, it was a good job. I could earn a little bit of income for my family. And then I had the flexibility where I could focus on my schoolwork. And uh, this was my life circumstance when I entered into what I would describe as one of the most painful experiences I've ever had. And you've had painful experiences of your own. Uh, your story is different from mine. But for me, it was so tough because I was working towards what I believed God wanted me to do. I was working towards this dream that I had for my life. And the pieces seemed to be fitting together. And then I was falsely accused of some pretty yucky stuff, ridiculous stuff. And if anybody who knows me, knew, Steve would never do the things that he's been accused of doing. That, that wasn't in question. And there was evidence to show that I hadn't done the things. But still, this is what I was facing in my life. And um, it, it grew more complicated and more stressful to the point where I ended up hiring a, a wrongful termination attorney to represent me, because it just was not being handled well um, by the school. And it was it was really tough because it felt like what was being communicated to me is you're not good enough. You are the bad things that you've been accused of doing. You're not worthy. And this was the voice 
that I kept hearing in my head over and over again, a really painful season. Now, um, that attorney um, did a really good job representing me, and I'm thankful. Um, he actually uh, got the, to undo the termination that I had so that I, I wasn't terminated, and I had a chance then to resign from the job because there was no way I was gonna work there anymore, right? After all the mess that I'd gone through and how they had mishandled it, I'm like, I'm not going back, absolutely not. I don't want that job anymore. Um, so, so I found myself looking for another job, another ministry opportunity, but I wasn't uh, filled with the same excitement and hope and passion that I had before. Now I was filled with anger and pain over the injustice. I was a mess. And I knew it needed to change, and I knew that God would see me through it, but that was a tough season in my life. So I was reaching out to a number of different congregations uh, back then, and uh, this one church that I got connected with asked me if I would uh, interview as a candidate for this position they had. And I read through the job description and realized, this fits me like a glove. Everything that was listed in there was stuff that I had experience doing, and stuff that I enjoyed doing, and stuff that I was good at doing, and that was what they wanted to hire someone to do. And so they asked if I would interview. Sure. The phone interview then turned into a Zoom interview, so we weren't face-to-face, -face, but we could see each other on the, the computer screen as we talked with each other. And then they invited me for that face-to-face -face interview after all these like, different things kept lining up, and it just it felt right. It felt so good. It felt so exciting. And, and I, uh, I remember thinking about this big decision knowing it wasn't only going to affect me, it wasn't just a job, it was gonna affect my family, and it was gonna affect that congregation. And that congregation isn't mine, it's God's congregation. Those people at that church, they belong to him, it's his church. And I, I didn't wanna mess that up. And there was this big catch, that's how it is, right? When you have a, a big story to tell in your life, there's, a, there's almost always a catch. For me, the catch was this particular job would require me to move not just to a new town, not just to a new state, but across the nation. I, I was gonna end up being separated, completely separated from my family, from Adrian's family, separated from my home. My kids would have to find a new school. We'd end up having to find a new bank and a new grocery store and most importantly, a new coffee shop. And, and uh, just completely starting over, a whole new set of friends, new social support system. Everything was gonna be new. I need a new, new mechanic. I didn't, wouldn't be able to find my way around town because I still stink at that. And some of you were thinking, oh yeah, we watched Steve go the wrong way just a couple days ago. Don't bring it up, don't tell the story. <laughs> yeah, stop it, keep it to yourself. <laughs> it, 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 all this, this cost, this catch that I faced, and I wrestled with it because I'm telling you, these people in that congregation, boy, they're fantastic people. And I had, we could sense this real connection with each other. There was a genuine love there. And I was already starting to feel that it, just, it seems like God is lining this up and, and I feel connected with these people. And some of these people are gonna see this video and think he's talking about us and I am and hi, I love you guys. But it weighed heavy on my heart because I did not want to get this wrong. And in that situation, the church board voted, they offered me the job, and, and I, you understand, I had been looking for a job for quite a while. I had been really hurting because of my experience of those false accusations and wanting justice, wanting to be made right, wanting to get back into the rhythm of things, to get back on the horse again. And it had been a long time, but I did not have this list of job offers lining up for me. Hey, Steve, you can choose this job with great benefits or that job with even better benefits or this job with a fantastic salary. And that was not happening for me. I didn't have a list of options to choose from, but I had this option and this was a good offer. So what was I gonna do? How would I decide? How would I figure out if that was the way that I should go in my life? I knew it was gonna be this huge change for my family and I was swirling around inside. Have you felt like that when you've made one of these big kinds of decisions? All the pressure, the stress, the anxiety. What if I get it wrong? What if I head the direction and then end up regretting it later? Because if I, if I make this commitment and I move across the country, it's not really easy for me to just move back. I'm gonna lose time and money and reputation and make this mess, not just for me, not just for my wife and kids, but also for that entire congregation. What was I gonna do? And it was swirling around inside and I was freaking out. And so I started asking, people that I trust for some advice. You've probably done that too, right? At some point, 
big decision. I need to hear what God wants, but I also am going to talk with the people I love, the people I trust, and say, what would you do? When you were facing this situation, how would you choose? What do you think that I should pick? I've got this option, I've got that option. What would you choose if you were in this situation? And so one of the people I asked about that was my sister. My older sister is a woman of God, and I respect her deeply. I've mentioned her a few times to you in the past, and uh, I, I was talking with her about the whole situation, explaining what was happening, and she gave me a piece of advice that I think was just fantastic. She knew how I was conflicted inside full of anxiety and freaking out, not knowing what to choose. And so she reminded me of the events of Exodus 14. In Exodus, uh, the, the Israeli people had been living in slavery in Egypt, and then God picked a person, a leader named Moses, to go to King Pharaoh and say, hey, Pharaoh, let my people go. And then the 10 plagues, because Pharaoh needed a little bit of convincing to let go of his free, free labor force, right? His free workforce, all these slaves that work for him. Uh, he didn't want to do that, but eventually he said, yep, you can go. And so they're on the way out, and they're headed towards this promise where God said, I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to establish you as a new people. You're not going to be slaves anymore, but you're going to be your own nation. And we're headed this direction, but they weren't there yet. And when they're on the way there, out of slavery, on the way to God's promise, Pharaoh realizes, hmm, I, I don't like what just happened here with all my workers that I didn't have to pay, a.k.a. slaves, and they just left, and they're not working for free for me anymore. I want them back. So he rallies his army, and he goes chasing after them. So picture yourself in their position. You are fleeing from an army that is organized and trained and armed, and they're chasing you, ready to either capture and or kill you, and... Then you see, behind you is the army, and before you is this massive body of water, and there's no way you can get across. It was the Red Sea. And, and they were trapped. Army on one side, body of water on the other side, and they're freaking out exactly like I was freaking out, trying to say, look, what am I supposed to do? Should I pick this option? Should I pick that option? I have to pick something. And they're, they're, they're crying out, and they're complaining, and they're like, what are we going to do? Oh, man, you know, it was better. It was more simple when we were slaves because then we didn't even have to make choices back then. I know it was crummy, but like now like, we, ha we don't have any good options. And Moses says to them this quote here from Exodus 14. I want to show you. Put it up on the screen here. He said this. Don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. They're swirling around in anxiety, freaking out. And he says, don't be afraid. Just stand still and watch the Lord rescue you today. They did not have the answers to the questions on their mind at the time. That's how we feel when we make big decisions, right? We don't have the answers yet. They did not have direction about which way they should go and what they should do. That's exactly how we are when we're freaking out about some hard decision that we're facing. We don't have direction yet. They had no solutions yet, but here Moses is saying to them, just be still, just be still and watch the Lord. I was freaking out and realized I was not doing the thing that Moses had told those people to do. I, I was not being still. I was not watching the Lord. I was watching all of the options and all of the questions and all of the frustration and all of the stress. And I was focusing on that. And I thought, I need to do what Moses told those people. I need to listen to my sister's advice. Quiet myself and be still, even though I didn't have answers. And I needed to watch what the Lord would do in that moment. And that wasn't necessarily an easy thing for me to do you understand, as you have been trying to hear from God, it's not an easy thing to quiet down all the stress and anxiety of life. It's like this noise, and you're trying to hear God, but all this other noise of stress and anxiety is screaming in your ears and screaming in your mind, and being able to hear from him gets harder and harder, and it quickly rushes back in when I try to quiet myself, and all those anx anxious thoughts and questions rush back in, and I needed to just stand still and watch the Lord. Pastor Pete Briscoe teaches that there are two ways that we can look at God's will. Two ways that people uh, kind of understand uh, our perception of, of God's will. Remember, God's will is what he wants for us, what he wants for us to do, what he has planned for us to do here. And, and a lot of people here understand God's will as being like a tightrope. So uh, you can see this image of a tightrope up here on the screen where the person is, is kind of walking from one side to the other along that really skinny rope. You know how it works, right? And, and the way that some people understand God's will is we're progressing through life from one side to the other. We're, we're progressing from one decision to the next, from one situation to the next. And as long as we get it right, 
As long as we step in the place where that's what God's will is, then we're okay. And we can stay up on that very small line, this tightrope that just goes in one little spot. But if you go the wrong direction, this is how some people see God's will. If you, if you move this way or that way, too far over this direction, if you take a giant step in the wrong direction, what's going to happen? Not a good situation, right? This is how a lot of people would think of God's will. And if I don't get it right, then I'm going to suffer and the people around me are going to suffer, and it's going to make this mess, and it's going to be more than a trip to the ER. It's going to end up making this consequence that I will face for the rest of my days here. And this is why we stress out about big decisions. This is the reason why we feel so anxious when we face those tough decisions, because we're thinking to ourselves, if I don't get it just right, then I'm going to fall, and I'm going to splat. And that was exactly how I felt. If I didn't figure out exactly what God wanted for me to do in that big decision in life, if I went too far to the left or too far to the right, if I didn't move quickly enough or slowly enough, I was going to plummet and I was going to suffer. My friends, that is not how God's will works. God's will is not like a tightrope. So if you feel like it that way in your head, this is a good moment for you because I'm going to give you a different picture, a better way, a more accurate and biblical way for us to understand God's will for us. Thankfully, that's what we can look at together a little bit in Romans 12. So if you got your Bible, take a peek there. If you didn't do that yet, go ahead and turn to Romans 12 with me. I want you to see this. We're going to look together at Romans 12. Uh, so if you find the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you've got Acts and Romans where you're going. And we're looking at Romans chapter 12. And we're going to be at the beginning of that particular chapter. And I'm going to ask you to underline four things. And some of you are thinking, I just grabbed the Pew Bible. Should I do this? It's okay. You have pastor's permission. Yeah, I'm going to ask you to underline four things in this text I'm going to show you here today. And as we talk about these four things, it will paint for us a different picture of how we can understand and then figure out God's will for our lives here. Look at the beginning of Romans 12, starting in the first verse. It says, therefore, boy, we didn't go very far before I hit pause, did we? <laughs> you know what the word therefore is, therefore? It's therefore a reason Thank Pastor Greg Bondurant for that one. Uh, the word therefore means because of the stuff that was said right before this, then the thing that we're saying right after this is true. Because of the stuff that was said in the first 11 chapters of Romans, then this next part in chapter 12 and what follows is what we're going to do about what happened here in these first 11 chapters. That's what therefore means. So it's assuming that we've read through the first 11 chapters. Now, if you've already read through the book of Romans, fantastic, two thumbs up. If you haven't, you could do it today in less than an hour, the whole book. I'll give you a fast-forward version of it. I'm going to have to leave a lot of stuff out, so I strongly encourage you to read this book, Romans, if you haven't done it yet. But if we went through it fast-forward, what you would find is it tells us sin earns death. Remember we talked about how sin only has one destination? Death, because sin separates us from God, and God is the only source of life. So regardless of what kind of sin it is, it leads to death. And Romans tells us that when we earn death because of our sin... We don't have to stay dead. Jesus died for us, and then he rose to life again. And if we place our faith in him, then he gives us this gift, this gift of forgiveness, this gift of salvation, this gift of new life that God offers to us, not because we deserve it. No, what do I deserve because of my sin? Death. That's what I earn. That's what you earn, all of us, because of our sin. That's what we deserve, death. But that's not what we get. We end up getting something else here. So I want, to, I want you to see that here with me. Back into the text again, and I promise I'll read a little bit further this time. Romans 12, starting at verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what? God's will. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The first word I want you to underline is the word mercy. That's close to the beginning. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. So use your pen or pencil and underline that word right now, the word mercy here. It means even though I earned punishment, I don't receive that punishment. So if I'm driving in my car and I'm speeding and driving like a maniac and the cop sees that and recognizes with the radar, hey man, you were way over the speed limit, he pulls me over, what have I earned? A ticket. 
But in the mercy of that law enforcement officer, if he chooses not to give me that ticket, that's mercy, even though I earned the punishment, right? Okay, this is what mercy does for us. Even though we have earned the punishment for our sin, God gives us mercy. He loves us anyway. He offers to us forgiveness and new life here. So the picture that I want you to think of, instead of a tightrope, when you're considering what does God's will look like, when I think about God's will, what he wants for me, instead of thinking about a tightrope, I want you to think about a playing field. It could be a soccer field, it could be a tennis court, it could be a basketball court, it could be a baseball diamond, but because God loves football best, we're going to say it's a football field, okay? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I grew up in Columbus, so go Bucks. <laughs> oh, I knew that would get a little bit of a response. So think of it as a playing field. Uh, I took Simon to a football game when he was little. He was around five years old, and uh, we had pretty good seats. Great vantage point of all the action there on the field. We were sitting not too far away from the band, so we got to listen to that. And we had a great, fun time there at that football game that day. But as you would expect, in between us in the stands and the field where the players were, there's a wall. I mean, and this is how it is in all of the football fields. There's either a wall or there's an understanding of you can't cross from this side to that side. If you're one of the spectators, like Simon and I were, from the seating in the stands, we physically couldn't, and we couldn't because of the rule, we couldn't go out onto the field with the rest of the players. Why not? Why couldn't we go out there? I won't say it. Why not? Distraction. Well, it would be a distraction, too. Uh, you're right, because <laughs> I obviously don't belong there, right, Kevin? It's, I'm not on the team. I, I can't go out there because I don't belong out there because I'm not on the team. Simon wasn't on the team, but in fact, we did go out onto the green. We did go out there with, right with the players, right there uh, on the field in the middle of all of the action. And how is it that we were allowed? We weren't thrown out. How is it that we were allowed to be there? I didn't try out for the football team. That's laughable. Look at me, right? If I tried out for the team, what would I earn? I would earn to get cut from the team. They would kick me out. That would be what I would earn here. I hadn't earned my way onto the team, but why was it that I was allowed there with the players down there on the green grass? It was mercy. What I deserved was to get thrown out, but what I got was mercy. I don't deserve it, but I was given it anyway. That's the same way that God works with us when he gives to us his mercy. We don't deserve to be on his team. We don't deserve to even be on the field. Because of our sin, we've earned far more than getting kicked out of the stadium. But because of his mercy, he invites us to be on the team. When you want to know God's will for your life, when you need to hear from God about the decision that you are making, a tough decision where you're trying to figure out, what should I do? Then you need to be on his team. And that's what we talked about just a few weeks ago on June 18th. So if you missed that particular sermon or if you want a reminder of it, head over to Facebook, see that video about what does that mean for me to get on his team, for me to belong here. And I want to uh, let this be the starting place for you and me as we're trying to discern God's will for the decision that you're facing or that you will face in the near future. Look at the text again in Romans 12. It says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's, there's the word we underlined, mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The next thing I want you to underline is the word offer. Find it there, it says to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. So underline, underline that word offer. We've already underlined mercy, and now we're gonna underline the word offer here. Think about uh, whatever you might know or, or at least listen and uh, eavesdrop on what, how it worked for the Jews when they would come to worship. They would come to the temple and they would bring a sacrifice and that sacrifice that they would offer there upon the altar would, would be some kind of an animal and the animal did not go back home with them when they were done, right? Okay, they would kill the animal, they would sprinkle or spread the blood and the animal is now gone. This is what the sacrifice meant for them to go and offer a sacrifice. But when we're looking at this text here in Romans 12, when it says that we're supposed to make this offering, it doesn't say offer an animal. What does it say? Take a peek at it. What does it say? Offer what? Offer your bodies. Offer yourself. It's not some animal. It's you and it's me. This is what we're being instructed to do, to put ourselves upon that altar. In sports, 
There is a big difference in sports between being on the team and being totally committed to the sport and to the team, right? I mean, you've seen somebody who, I mean, they're on the team, but they're not the MVP. They may wear the jersey, but they're not the one who's scoring all the points and making all the plays and everybody else is cheering and celebrating like, boy, am I glad that that person's on the team because even though they're on the team, it's not the same thing as being totally devoted to the sport. And that's how some people are with God. We'll show up. That athlete may show up to practice the way that some of us show up to God. We're in the area. We're surrounded by other people who are playing the sport. We're talking about the sport. Well, we might participate a little with some of the things that the rest of the team does, but it's half-hearted. It's not devoted. It's the bare minimum to keep wearing the jersey. That is not how an athlete becomes an MVP. That's not how Patrick Mahomes threw 400, or, excuse me, 5,000 yards and over 50 touchdowns and led the Chiefs to the AFC Championship in 2018. He was all in. If you love sports, you know the MVP is always all in. And it is the same thing for you and me when we want to hear what is God's will for my decision? What is God's will for my life? What is it that he wants for me to do in this situation as I face a tough decision? We don't get part way onto the altar. We don't offer a portion. I mean, we're talking about way more than a couple hours on a Sunday morning. We're talking about way more than 10% of the money that we have. All of ourselves belongs on that altar. Have you placed all of yourself on the altar? Have you said, God, all of me, all of my life, all of my thinking, everything that I love, everything that I fear, everything that I plan, everything that I hope for, everything that I dream for, all of me, God, even this decision completely belongs to you. Have you said that? When you think about the decision that you face, because sometimes we ask, hey, God, tell me what you want to do, but what we really want is for him to tell us the thing that we're kind of already leaning towards. This is what I want, and I want God to give me his blessing and say, yeah, sure, you can do that. It's something totally different for me to say, you choose, God. You get a pick. Regardless of the cost to me, I lay myself in totality upon this altar so that I and my decision belong completely to God. Ask yourself if you've offered your decision to God, committing to doing it his way regardless of the cost. You've got to be devoted to doing it his way before you even know exactly how that's going to work out. Interestingly enough here, it does not say that we die when we do this. When we think about the Israelites and the animal sacrifices that they made, I said that, that animal didn't come home because it's dead. It's kind of gross. But we don't die. That's not what it says here. It tells us in the text here to offer yourself as what kind of a sacrifice? Living. This has to do with the way that you and I live. It's not the end of life. It's the way of life. When I offer all of who I am and all of this decision to God, that's the way I live my life because it completely belongs to him. More than 10%, more than a couple hours on Sunday, all of my life is committed to his way. If you want to hear from God, if you're struggling to get his direction or some answer or help with some decision that you're facing right here, you need to be all the way on the altar. Not occasionally on the altar. Not oh, when I happen to think about him on the altar. Not, well, if it works out okay for me and I don't really mind paying the cost, then I'll get on the altar. All the way on the altar. All of it. All of the decision, all of the outcome, all of the unknown, all of the cost. All of the unanswered questions. All of it. So ask yourself, have I done that? Have I done that with me? And have I done that with my decision? Some of us ask to hear from God, and we've already heard from him, but we didn't like what he said. Some of us have said, God, I want you to help me make this decision, or I want you to help reveal your will for me so that I know how to live my life, and he's already told you, but we've thought to ourselves, mm, I, I mean, I, maybe he'll give me another option, and so we just kind of pretend like we didn't hear it, or we just don't embrace it, and, and we're hoping for him to say something else, give us some other option, give us some, a different direction here for us, and he's already said it, but we pretend like he didn't say it, and we just keep listening for something else. Apply that to the sports arena. When the athlete 
is told by the coach, run laps. But the athlete thinks, I'm tired. I'm not in the mood to run laps. I ran earlier today, and the coach says, run laps. What do you think happens to that player if the player acts as if he or she had not heard the coach say run laps and decides and said, I'm not going to run laps. I'm going to do something else. What do you guess might happen to that athlete? Uh -huh. Not a good day, right? So you can see on the screen here this picture of the playing field. And I mean, you know, around the outer edges, they paint these lines. And so we know that all of the action is designed to be played inside of those painted lines. And what do we call it when the person who has the ball travels outside of those lines? What do we call that? Out of bounds. It's out of bounds. That's against the rules. You're not allowed to do that. That is off limits. That is out of bounds here. There are rules that the athletes must follow in order to win the game, in order to play that game. Look with me again at Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, keeping this in mind. The same text again. It says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's what? Mercy. That's the first thing we underlined. To offer, there's the second thing we underlined, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you to underline that phrase, pleasing to God. There it says, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. Underline that part right there. So we underlined mercy, we underlined offer. Now we're underlining the phrase, pleasing to God. Ask, as you consider the decision that lies before you, whether this option that you're thinking about taking is in bounds or out of bounds. Whether it is okay with the rules that have been established for the game or whether it is against the rules. Whether it is pleasing to God if you take this option or if it is displeasing to him. So if your decision is about a moral dilemma here, then you're trying to figure out what is the, the morally right thing to do, keep it in bounds. When you're thinking about your options of which one to choose, you cannot pick the option that God has said, that's out of bounds. That's against the rules. You can't go that route. If you're thinking about this relationship where you're trying to decide, what am I gonna do in this relationship where I have been hurt? Then you gotta, you, you gotta keep it within the boundaries that God has established for us, the boundaries of forgiveness and also the boundaries in relationships where things have got to change and it can't work the way that it did before and it's going to look different than the way that it did before. You've got to keep it within those boundaries there. If you're thinking about your job and trying to make a decision about your job and you find out that this employer is doing some shady under the table kind of stuff, then don't take that option. That is not an option that is in bounds for you. You need to have a different option to find a different option where the kind of business that they're doing isn't the shady under the table kind of stuff. If it's the dating relationship that you're thinking about, there are things that God says are in bounds and there are things that God says are out of bounds when it comes to our dating relationships and sexuality and the way that we interact with the people that we have romantic relationships with. Whatever option it is that you are considering as you think about your decision, make sure that you're keeping it in bounds. And so long as you do, you get to choose. It's not a tightrope. When the player is running the play from one side of the field to the other, they get to choose which way they go. There's a plan, there are rules, there are boundaries, but as long as it's within those rules, as long as it's within those boundaries, you get to choose whether you take that option or whether you don't. But if that option that you're considering is out of bounds, then you must not choose it. It's against the rules, and you already know that you shouldn't do it. Even if you're trying to rationalize it or ignore the rules, you already know that's not something that you should be doing. God has already communicated that to you. That's why we underline the phrase, pleasing to God. When I'm thinking about the options for my decisions, I need to pick the option that is pleasing to him, okay? Look at the text with me one more time. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, it says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Verse 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. I want you to underline the phrase, test and approve. You see it there, it says, You will be able to test and approve and approve what God's will is. Take your pen or your pencil and underline those words, test and approve. 
I want to figure out his way. Because like I said, his way is always better than mine. The only time that my, work, my way works out is when it lines up with his. When I try to do it my way and it's not his way, I make a mess of things and then have regrets and consequences and end up hurting myself and the people around me. So I want to do it his way. And his way, his will, the way that he wants you to live your life, his will is three things that are listed right here. And I love what it says about what God wants for your life and for mine. It says that it's good. It's a good for you, it's good for me. That's what God wants for you. So if you go his way, you don't have to worry about, well, is this gonna be bad? No, go his way, it's good. The next thing that it says is, it is, see it? Take a peek, good, pleasing. That means you're gonna like it, yes. When I go his way, it doesn't mean that it's always easy, but it is pleasing. And in fact, it's so good that it even describes it as perfect. There is no better way to go than his way. That's why I wanna know God's will for my life. That's why you wanna know God's will for your life here. That's why we wanna be able to test and approve his will. So after you have joined the team by mercy, we've already worked that part out, and you've, you've already gotten onto, if, if this is true of you, you've already received and experienced the mercy of God and you've gotten onto his team. And after you've given every part of yourself offering yourself on that altar, not just occasionally when you feel spiritual or when you're expected to do so, but after you've put all of you and all of your decision, offering it to God there upon that altar, and after you've identified the option that you're considering for the decision that you're trying to make, and you look at this option and you say, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's not out of bounds. It's not against the rules. It's, it's pleasing to God here. Once you've checked off all of those boxes right here, then you are given by God the free will to choose. And I think that is a great freedom that you and I can enjoy. This freedom where we get to pick, we get to test it out, and if it works and we like it, then keep doing it. Or test out the option because, hey, I'm on his team and I've offered all of me and all of my decision, and I've made sure that the option I'm considering is it's inbounds, it's within the rules, then try the option. And if it didn't work, then, well, okay, I tested it and now that's, that's not the way I'm gonna go. Pick it, try it. Test and approve it. Either way, you have the freedom to choose. These four pieces in Romans 12 that talk about figuring out what God wants for your life and for mine are a good way for us to work through the decisions that you're considering. When you look at your options and you're trying to pick between them, then you can think through these four words, four phrases that are in Romans 12, one and two. And you can ask yourself these questions and get yourself to the point where, okay, now I know, because I'm in balance, I'm on his team, I've offered all of me to him, now I know God gives me and you the freedom to choose. And when you've got more than one option that you're still not sure what to choose between, then there are some strategies that we can look at for those two. But we'll talk more about that next week. Okay, let's pray together. God, I wanna thank you for the power of your word to apply to our life situations. I'm glad that you have a good, pleasing, and perfect will for us. And I'm glad that you position us in such a way that you let us be a part of what's happening. You let us pick, you let us choose. And so I'm gonna pray this morning, Lord, for those who are in the midst of making a decision that you would, by your Holy Spirit, guide us through those conversations, this text, those questions, to make sure that as we are considering our option, our different options, we're considering them your way, in a way that is pleasing to you, Father. We want to do it your way. We need your help to figure out how to do it your way. And this is our prayer to you this morning, God. Amen. May we not be afraid to move forward with the options that are in bounds and pleasing to our God. May we decide in confidence, trusting that God has empowered us to choose. May we place ourselves and our decisions completely upon the altar so that we are His, so that we can see that His will is good, pleasing, and perfect.